Good evening, Bill. Good evening, Sandy. How are you? I'm okay. Feels so empty, just the two of us. <laughs> Without Cisco's giant persona and personality to fill the space. Yeah, well. That's how we cope. You'll uh you'll have to just talk to him without me and then, you know. Someday. Someday. Uh you know, I think I think we can fill the space. I think you and I have just the amount of gumption to to make that happen. Well, let's see. Tonight we're going to talk about worship. Okay. <laughs> and we've talked before about uh, religious painting, uh, frequently, actually, uh, even though yep. we haven't necessarily focused on worshipfulness or or faith. Um. But we've looked at a lot of painting over our last couple of years of recording together. Well, I think I think to be fair, like 80% of all painting is basically religious. So yes, it's kind of hard to avoid in a kind of Western canon of yeah. painting. Um, but what I also I'm thinking about is how we come to revere what we see in art. Um, and kind of like the that maybe the personal reasons that things particularly stand out to us. So tonight I've only got two things to, to share, but um, I've chosen them because they're things that I was uh, aware of as a child in Glasgow. Um, can you think of a piece of art that you saw as a much younger person, Bill, that really stood out to you, that you then became perhaps transfixed by or... Um, How caused... young are we talking? Well, maybe in childhood uh, or when you were a teen or when you left home to go to college, for example, is there something that you saw? I mean, you've talked before about um, even in our in one of our earliest meetings together, uh, you talked about standing at the painting uh, of the sisters. Sure. That was in college. Yeah. But even before then, I mean... I had a big thing for Raphael's School of Athens for a while. Mm. Something about that painting still gets me. Um, well, it's the perspective, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, I think there's like, it's it feels, it's not obviously perfect, but it feels perfect. It feels like one of those ones that's just like done. Well, I mean, it is kind of perfect, that particular yeah, well, image. Yeah, exactly. But it's uh, funny you mentioned, it's funny you mentioned that. I don't know if you did it deliberately because you know what's coming, but... Um, Perspective. We're, playing, we're playing with perspective here too. Yeah. So I just find this painting um, bizarre uh, and it's very familiar. Uh, those two things, something that is bizarre yet something that is familiar is a kind of odd, an odd mix, isn't it? Do you think it's, it's familiar in the sense that you recognize it, but the more you think about it as an adult, you find it is actually far more bizarre than you thought it was when you, you know, your, your sort of um, imprint of it feels familiar, but the reality of it is that it's quite bizarre. Does that make sense? It does. And I don't know if it is that for me. I mean, this is um, Dali, Salvador Dali, not known for his kind of <laughs> religious painting in this way. Um, this is a, a very kind of unusual image, I guess, although he was obviously renowned, well known for his technical mastery and his ability to paint things that otherwise are um, maybe even hyper real in a different context, always with a kind of surreal edge, maybe. Um, most people listening will know that Dali is most famous as a surrealist artist and he was a very important uh, Dadaist and uh, his work is often seen much the same as someone like you know Ansel Adams people have become so elevated in our consciousness as artists that they sort of almost lose their punch a bit you know uh, the melting clocks become so familiar again even though they're so bizarre that we don't really notice them anymore is that kind of what you mean yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like you think, oh, right, that's Dali and you move on. And then you're like, hold on a second. That's 
but I mean, a very his strange painting, image. His strangest paintings adorn the most benign spaces, you know, office corridors and yeah. and. It's also weird. Doctor I mean, the melting, like the perspective, the one at the MoMA was like, it's like this big, it's tiny, right? Yeah, yes. Do you know how big this one is? Um, I do. And the reason also why I'm talking about this in context of worshipfulness is because I spent a lot of time with this painting as a child. Um, and it does hang now in Calvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum in Glasgow. Although when I was growing up, it was in a different position in the gallery so it's actually quite a large canvas it is looming is a is a description that I've heard some people use quite sort of right especially in its old position Calvin Grove Art Gallery is the most extraordinarily beautiful um Victorian building and on its upper floors are halls galleries of hundreds of paintings and corridor spaces are weird places for paintings of any value. But this painting was hung at the end of a very long corridor. Um, and to approach it, the beautiful marble floors of the gallery kind of extended that sense of um, approach and perspective. Do you think they did that to mimic sort of a nave in a church, like at the end of the, you know what I mean? Possibly. Yeah. Um, I mean, this painting was acquired by Glasgow almost immediately after it was made. It was made in 1951, I think by 1952, uh, the acquisition had gone through and it was then brought to Glasgow. And actually lots of people protested about that. They felt that the the sum that had been paid, I think it was something like 8,000 pounds which at the time was a lot of money for a single article but actually was apparently under the value it was intended to be sold for lots of people in Glasgow at the time felt that that money should have gone into supporting Scottish artists okay um but anyway I spent a lot of time at Calvin Grove Art Gallery as a child because it was just down the road from where I lived um we went as a family uh, often. I would go with my grandfather on a Saturday afternoon um, and the two of us would play a game of approaching the painting. Um, and there always seemed to be such a kind of playfulness to the optical illusion of it. So it, to me, it really felt like, you know, Christ isn't in fact life-size, but as a child, it seemed enormous anyway. And um, having an awareness of Christian uh, story, the story of Christ, you know, I don't know whether that added anything to this, but simply the fact that there was a man on a cross floating above the earth seemed fantastical to me. You know what's interesting about this? Is, so you see it as if you covered up the top half of the painting and you see the landscape at the bottom. Mm. You see it as Christ is kind of coming in above you like this. Correct? Christ is a, is above. Well, yeah, we're of... above Christ. Well, okay. Well, that's, that, I guess that's my question is that you could see that as, you know, you're looking at me on the landscape and then Jesus is, is coming in like this above. Mm. You could see it that way with Jesus facing downward, basically. Or you could see it as sort of two completely different perspective planes that are just intersecting weirdly in some surrealistic composition. Well, I mean, Dali used uh, the, the, the triangle as a means to, to drive us in, um, but also an allusion, I guess, to the Trinity. Um, I like using the term driving in when there's nails involved in the painting. Well, no, actually, Bill... Yeah. There's there's no nail. Oh, right, yeah. Uh and um apparently that's because Dali conceived of this painting because of a dream he had. Okay. Uh and in the dream it was conveyed to him that should he include blood or any kind of viscera 
nails, anything that was otherwise of a kind of worldly violence, that it would mar his masterpiece. So also, you know, I, I do wonder about this painting as, you know, Christ of St. John of the Cross. Uh, is it a religious painting in a Christian context? Well, of course, yes, it's Christ on the cross. But there's so much about it that is mystical. And um, I'm not saying that Christianity isn't mystical, but there are so many other kind of elements, esoteric elements that come from typical for Dali, cherry picked from perhaps other languages about worship or faith or simply spirituality. Anyway, as a child, I was in, in so many ways unaware of this, but I did come to revere this painting. Now, in part, that was because I enjoyed the experience always of returning. It was something, as I said, very familiar to me, going to the gallery, climbing up the stone stairs, walking along the corridor, counting the tiles, um, skipping or hopscotching, playing games on the corridor, you know, laughing and giggling with my grandfather about the dusty old, you know, curators at the edge, all these things kind of come into why this painting stands out to me. It so happens that actually Scotland voted on its favourite painting and this got 29% of the vote out of all paintings. So, you know, it's not just me that thinks of this painting in a, in a kind of in reverence. Well, if, if it's also a highly regarded painting in, you know, a country that has art museums, but is not well known for its art museum specifically, you know what I mean? Like it could just be, a lot of people don't know a lot about art. I think it's cool painting. I'm just saying, do you think that your memories of your time with your grandfather in that sense are really how it was? You paint it in a very cinematic light. It would hard be hard to not be kind of cinematic in that space, by the right, way. There are, just been, some, so okay. there are just some places that have got this, I don't know, it's like the Natural History Museum in London, right? <laughs> or the Met in New York. Yeah. You know, like I've been up and down those steps outside the Met. I've believed myself to be, you know, some kind of beautiful movie star wandering around in Dior, you know, I've all these fantasies of these places. They're they're very kind of persuasive in one's memories, aren't they? Of course, yeah. I mean, I always walk around, there's that the book about the little kids sleeping in the Met. You know that book? No. There's a that's the adventure the something of mrs farnsworth or something like that anyway it's like two little kids who run away and they hide out in the net and they like sneak around and sleep there overnight they're like run away and they're like living at the net and they're you know they collect coins from the pools where people throw them in for for good luck and like eat food the next day with those coins and stuff it's just like the idea of like imagine they lock the doors at the end of the night and you're running around the Met through the Egyptian wing and through the painting wings and the, whatever it is. And like, you know, of course, I mean, there's, I mean, it's, it's, it's wild with fantasy, right? Well, I have to say actually, again, um, anybody listening to this, if you haven't been to Calvin Grove, you should go because it is a beautiful jewel. Um, downstairs is kind of like a natural history museum. There is some paintings okay. on the ground floor. Now they, they redesigned the layout of the gallery in the early 2000s and they had a much more uh what they would describe as accessible curation of their collections but as a, a small child again you know there were lots of dioramas with great white sharks and there's a tyrannosaurus rex and there was a mummy and there's a sarcophagus and there are lots and of airplanes hanging and stuff from what i can yeah, see yeah so um 
the whole thing built the kind of the ante until we would reach this painting. I mean, this painting is controversial as well. I mean, it was attacked in the 60s by somebody who attacked it with a stone and then ripped at it with his bare hands. I think he was, I, I don't actually know the reason why, but I'm going to assume there was some sense that this was blasphemous because we looked sure. down on Christ. Um, I've always been curious about the cross in this. It feels very bl blocky is the word I'm looking for, but it feels very foundational that that, that that cross does not look like it's made of wood. You know what I'm saying? It looks like it's stone. Yeah. But like very smoothly honed stone. You know what I mean? Like stone that had been worked. But the, the direction of the light, for example, um, where is the light coming from? Why yeah. is it coming why is it coming from over there? You know, what is that source? Where are we? That's why to me, it feels like it's two paintings strapped together more than it does a single painting. That, that he's just like, it, that he never intended for it to all be in one three-dimensional space. Oh, he definitely did. I mean, it was fully he did before. Um... Uh, not that not that he didn't intend for it to make it this way. I just mean that like that basically he's playing with reality is what I'm saying. It's very odd. It is an odd painting. And again, that's what I mean. I, I, I wish we could somehow articulate what it means to find that place between something that is so familiar. Like this is a stalwart of my childhood with something that is actually so bizarre. Uh, Do you think that if it, it if it hadn't, had religious overtones this painting say that again you start to if, if this painting did not have religious overtones and this is regardless of the of of your own personal beliefs mm -hmm. if if the fact that it has religious overtones because originally your title for this conversation was worship right yeah if if this was a purely secular painting do you think you give it extra points for secular worship because it has religious worship qualities does that make sense um i don't know if i'm answering the right question but okay, for example like, yeah. I, I could say that i have done something akin to worship in encountering works of art that haven't been religious at all yes but 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 you you do you chose to show this as something that you had some sort of feeling of reverence for, yeah. As a child, yeah. Do you think that reverence is enhanced by the fact that it is, itself is a religious painting? And had it been a painting of you know, no, I some th guy I jumping through the air, or whatever it is, it would have been the same. I, I, I guess that's thing. part of what I'm I'm looking at in myself is that you know I wasn't overly exposed to, um. Christian culture as a child mm -hmm. um I was exposed to Christian culture because it's just part of British Scottish culture Western, Western life yeah um, exposed to Christian culture in that we celebrated Christmas and Easter uh and that occasionally I would get dragged to a semblance of Sunday school but, you know, I, I wouldn't, uh, and I have never, even as a child, been told you are a Christian. You know, that, that just didn't kind of come up in me. Uh, so I think that the worshipfulness, the reverence I feel for this is really about all those other things that come together. Kind of in spite of the religious context of the work. Okay. I mean, there are things simply in aesthetics that align with our kind of psychological need for particular forms or a specific sense of uh, harmony or a balance visually. You know, we know that our 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 brain is stimulated.
you know by things that look like this in the same yeah. way that Raphael was very aware of the power of um perspective to to pull us pull us in um and how powerful that could be to make us feel connected to a place or a space funnily enough in this you know what place are we actually connected to are we collect connected to what i think is supposed to be well i don't i actually the the place in the painting he was living somewhere by the sea and he used that as the as the landscape he also actually i didn't know this until much later but there was a stunt man he used as uh, the as model, model and he hung him from a gantry to get that foreshortening that kind of perspective on the body um anyway that would have been very uncomfortable and bill i asked you and i didn't really get a particular answer i suppose what what is something that you have revered in art really truly it's funny because there if you ask me about my favorite works of art that i there are things like the calling of St. Matthew, right? The Caravaggio that I stood and spent way too many Euro coins lighting up and staring at when I was in Rome last time. Uh, Single-handedly keeping the church, you know. Yeah, ticking over. Ma making making sure that the church had enough money to buy the spaghetti they needed that year. Um, uh which, you know, ironically, I I am not a religious person. I am a non-believer. Mm. So I, it's kind of not funny, but sort of interesting that some, a lot of the paintings that I have very strong feelings about have religious subject matters. But I think that has more to do with the fact that religious subject matters were used by a lot of the artists Whose yeah, work I, mean, I like because it was that time prevalence of painting, isn't there? I mean, we we both of us, I think, love the kind of late Renaissance, early Bar Baroque period. Sure, and and but even now, I mean, even in secular art, there's callbacks to so much of all of that that you really can't get away from it, you know, very easily. No. Uh, uh, I mean, I was looking at the uh, the Klimt painting that they have at MoMA yesterday. And it's like, there's all kinds of religious overtones and a lot of that stuff too. But is, is this kind of um, religious, religiousness, is it just inevitable in Western painting then? Is that kind Does of he, what you Do you think Dali did this as with reverence towards Christianity or do you think he was just using Christian symbolism as a prop. Um, well, I mean, he also used as a bit of a, a much as it came to him in a cosmic dream because he's Dali, um, who, by the way, <laughs> in terms of art history, Dali, probably quite an unpleasant person. Oh, he seems like a real pain in the neck, yeah. Anyway, um, he also apparently based this on a 16th century drawing by a, a Spanish priest or friar. Mm. Yeah. I... He seems like the kind of guy who would be like, oh yeah, I'm going to paint you this religious thing. It's like, screw Jesus. You know, like I could imagine him being both. You know what I'm saying? I think he would have understand, understood the kind of sensational aspect sure of this i mean he, this is he, he, he goaded the controversy yeah 1951 he was established you know he was yeah. not scrimping no um but that's also when you can take chances because no one's going to say anything because you are who you are I know that a lot of people who supported Dali and thought his work was brilliant often got very annoyed with the way that his character and celebrity overtook his work. Yeah, but he was doing that on purpose, I think. 
Yes, but um, I think that's why this. Pain- You're saying that, that that it detracts from like people see him and they go, "Oh God, Dali's so annoying with his stupid mustache and whatever it is." If he just shut up and made his paintings, his paintings would be more respected. Maybe, but I mean, don't forget his paintings were hugely are hugely respected. Oh, I'm not. I'm not doubting they are. I'm trying to are just trying to understand your your argument that people seem to have. No, I'm just kind of citing more that uh, I know I've read that um, his supporters often felt that his work was overshadowed by him. And those were his supporters. It was a really polarizing character anyway. And even amongst the ranks of people who were um, friends or patrons, they I don't know if it was out of concern for him, but perhaps more concern for the legacy of his work that there was a sense that, you know, you buy a Dali painting if you can afford it, but you also buy Dali. And that that's not kind of okay, really, in serious painting. But then he, as a surrealist, especially as a Dadaist, you know, does he give a shit about seriousness? Well, also very ahead of his time, 20th century celebrity for celebrity's sake, all that stuff, right? You know what I mean? Like it's it's almost like early early Warhol kind of pop art sort of I am the sensation and my work is you know it, right. it's all that swirled up in it right Dali is hugely influential on pop art right exactly so mm-hmm. I'm just saying that like you know yes all that stuff is true but maybe it's just that he and I don't agree with that the direction that all of that went kind of makes me roll my eyes but he was ahead of his time in going down that road but do you think uh, as a as a painting by somebody, Dali, we know at least a little about this zany, polarizing character. Does this look like a Dali painting? I think the precision of it and everything, yes. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, it's funny because I... The more I stare at this, it's like I've looked at this painting a lot before in books and whatnot. Mm. And it always made me feel uncomfortable. Mm. And I think it is because of the sort of stone slab feel of the cross. It feels very like impending. Well, you know, it's like it's a morgue slab, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah, I think yeah. just the absence of nails, for example, implies that he's uh, um subsequently, Alex, if you're watching this, I haven't forgotten that you and I as teenage girls used to go to Calvin Grove almost every weekend in life. Uh my teenage one of my closest teenage friends, Alex and I used to go to Calvin Grove a lot as well. And we would look at this and we talked about it as, you know, is, is, is he lifting up? Is he, has he been lying on the slab? Yeah. You know, I was just about, I was just saving right now, saving the painting so I could flip it around Mm. because there's an argument to be made that we're looking at it kind of upside down. Yeah. And that, yes, he's looking up, he's lifting his torso up towards the sky where this weird heaven is. You know what I'm saying? That he's looking at. But then that's very dangerous, isn't it? And I think this is why it's such a contentious painting in so many ways. Why is that dangerous? Is that if we flip the painting and we allow Christ to rise up, then we also invert the cross. Uh, Yes. But maybe that's what he had in mind the whole time. Well, who knows with Dali? But I'm sure I'm sure some very smart art historian, Dali specific, surrealist scholar has written six or seven books on the subject. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that we have not read anybody watching. No, of course not. Anyway, so worshipfulness. <laughs> I think that as a child I came to kind of worship this painting. The irony being that I didn't worship it because it was a painting of Christ. But but it is a painting that has that level of 
airs and impact. Like it's a painting deserving of being worshiped. Does that make sense? Maybe. All right, tell me about this one. So then fast forward a few years, fully autonomous, no longer having to travel around town with chaperones. The Gallery of Modern Art opened in Royal Exchange Square in Glasgow, I think in 1993, maybe. I should have looked that up. But anyway, I remember it. And I remember going to it and being amazed at what I could find inside. Maybe it was just slightly later. And this was there, Nikki de saint Fal, Hotel du Chamort. So it's from the series of shooting paintings that she made, and it is an, it's an altar. And uh, it sat at the very back of the large ground floor gallery uh, in Goma, the Gallery of Modern Art. Um, and I thought it was the most amazing thing that I could encounter as art. And Why did you love it so much? I, I think because it truly encapsulated otherness. And again, all the time you're thinking about, you know, the messages that we receive kind of purely without, without knowledge. So like I hadn't read anything about this. I didn't know anything uh, in the same way that as a younger child, I didn't know anything about the Dali painting. I just knew the the painting, this was kind of like that. It was fresh for me. So I was meeting it with no uh, hang-ups. And I love that because that so seldom happens when we are adults. Um, but anyway, this I did by the age of being a teenager. I understood the, the language of, of worship or worship symbols much more. They were, I did know them but taken out of place and used in a way that seemed to be creating such strong messages about um, gender and um, violence. And uh, yet was still being playful, even though it was so kind of visceral. In many ways, this is a counterpoint to the Dali painting. This is bloody and messy. This is violent. This is um, also, I found it quite, I remember faceless in that Nikki de Saint Fal, I could read the name and I knew nothing of her. In fact, I didn't until much later make the connection between this piece and the very large curvaceous sculpture, colorful sculpture that was in the foyer as she came in, one of her big female formed sculptures, which seems so in, in one way, very benign. Again, this is without any information really. Yeah. Anyway, Nikki de Do you think it's because it started all white? Do you think there's like a pure, weird purity to it? Maybe. Just trying to figure out like what what drew you to it specifically. Um, I I I don't discount in myself the appeal of shock. Okay. You know I'm a sucker for sensation, especially when I was a a teenager. Yeah. And this, you know. There was that thirst. You've kind of alluded to this before, and I rather probably put you down about it, which is that you know. <laughs> I'm glad you're admitting it. Maybe a little, but there's a sense that, as a younger person, we our drivers are in different gears, obviously, and sensation and salaciousness and things that are edgy just for the sake of it, are very appealing 
in the same way that introspection and the kind of like sort of serious navel gazing is so attractive uh as you pointed out to a certain type of art school female now i was pre-art school female at this point but i was a burgeoning teenage art school female in waiting I think <laughs> yes, the preferred term. i was <laughs> <laughs> it was <laughs> you can't discount how powerful this work was is but it's so amazing because i would look at this and walk right by this does absolutely <laughs> nothing for me oh nothing. no this was um but see i also interestingly enough i was not a when i was younger well in general, still I'm not in many ways. Mm. I am not looking for the edgy. I was never one who was looking for transgression or to break rules or like I've never been that person. So yeah, I, I then and now don't know what I make of this. 96. 96 so i was 16 when i would have seen this first yeah, my god been... raging pit of hormones rampant sense of my entitlement to art i think maybe part of it is that you probably always thought of yourself as you know the 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 the, the art school lady in waiting joke aside you saw yourself as somebody who was going down the art road. I never did. Like I would go, I would look at art, but I never thought of myself as an artist. Cause at the time I was, if, if any art musician, maybe, but even then it's just, it's interesting. I, I never, I never had the rebellious art school kid thing. But, you know, what was amazing about this is that uh, unlike with the Dali painting, uh, I went through a phase of loving Dali when I was still at school. But when you're 12 and 13, I think Dali paintings are like, you know, amazing. Or they they were in the late 80s, early 90s to me. Sure. And um, That painting wasn't that old when you were seeing it for the first time. It's only 35 years old. But this, you know, considering myself probably to be much more sophisticated age 16, uh, it, it kind of met me. Uh, again, I'm, I'm saying about this, seeing it really for the first time, the first few times when I didn't know anything about Nikki de Saint-Fal. I didn't really know about this. I took it as I found it and I was drawn to it. I found it um, extraordinary. And it's here for worship, not because it's an altar. That's almost irrelevant. It's about the power it had over me to make me return to it. And over time, of course, I looked up Nikki de Saint-Fal. I found out about her uh, life, her practice, I, saw pictures of her and I think you know you've kind of said this about Francesca Woodman you know there's like a sometimes there's a you, you're drawn to things that are familiar because they really are familiar I then started thinking you know Nikki de Saint-Fal was part of a, a wave of women that I recognized were going to be very important to me and in that sense I was hugely respectful uh, probably more so than I could be with Dali later if, if you had found out if let's say you found out now it comes out some big expose comes out and says it turns out this woman the person who was always interviewed and photographed was not actually the person who made these things. They were actually made under a pseudonym who was a man. Did mm. that change the way you see this? No, I don't think so. It's just interesting because you uh, you 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 even described it in the first part as like seeing it from a feminine point of view. 
Yes, and sometimes I know you've taken me to task on this before. This definitely is a thing that I do agree I've seen from a female perspective. But I mean, did you see that even before you knew it was made by a woman is my question. Yes, like I said, I didn't, Nikki, I didn't know. Was that a man or a woman? It could be. It seemed to be be gendered to me. I didn't have to know. Um, I mean, Nikki de Saint-Fal, she had a terrible time by all accounts in her early life. She was totally traumatized by... Her family, her mother was quite violent to her. Her father, by all accounts, sexually abused her for for years. Um, She had married, first marriage when she was very, very young, a friend of her father. She had a couple of children. She was dominated entirely by a very masculine, very Catholic culture. They were devout Catholics. And then um, she became a a fashion model. She was photographed widely. Um, And I'm not so sure about what really happened at the transition point between old life, new life. But she's a pioneering artist, really. Apparently, Gloria Steinem saw her walking along uh, and she had taken this sort of amazing kind of transformation away from being the good Catholic girl to being this other thing. Now, quite what that means, I'm, I don't know, but I can imagine that she just seemed to be a person in charge of her own destiny at last and I wrote it down uh Steinem said that is the first free woman I have ever seen in real life Hmm. I want to be just like her I mean the Sanfal would have been surrounded by very um powerful male artists and she collaborated with lots of um very highly regarded male artists Rauschenberg and John's and I mean her second husband was Tangley, the kinetic artist. Um mm. powerful stuff to me, I think. <clears throat> and if I see this or see any of these kind of pieces from this series, the shooting series, it is reverence. Uh, and that now is more to do with what I know. Whereas I remember the possibly more truthful reverence I had for it at the very outset. In that I don't necessarily revere the context of this painting. But right. whatever it is, the, the symbol of it in itself, not the symbol of Christ, not the symbol of the cross, just the symbol of the painting in my memory, what it represents to me personally, it makes me worshipful of it. It's it, What's interesting about it is the Dali I the symbolism makes me feel weird. But if I worshipped it, I would worship it on the from the point of view of the craft because it's so well done. Mm. I need to do more reading and find a way into this. A way into what, Bill? This piece in her art. She um, I don't think she was a man hater, but she was fiercely critical of what she saw as the destruction of humankind through man's or men's actions. You know, shooting could be seen as a kind of reactive piece against her Catholic upbringing. The extreme indoctrination felt by her as a young girl 
it could be an expression of trauma or the rage she felt at the the structure and hierarchy that meant that she was available to sexual abuse. Uh, it could be an expression of uh, frustration, confusion, fear, you know, Cuban Missile Crisis. There are lots of things happening when she would have been making this work. Um, I just want to say that she said, um, talking about shooting, actually the act of shooting, an act of violence to make this work. Only a woman could use those destructive contraptions that man has imagined for a constructive, um, okay. for a constructive end. And o that is only beautiful. a woman. Come on. Like I understand the quote. I understand what she's trying to say, but like ridiculous hyperbole. Ridiculous hyperbole. There's nothing about being a man or a woman or whatever that has anything to do with having a good idea of how to make art. No, but I think you know. there's a very valid comment on all those things that in the 20th century emerged because of a very masculine culture that enabled, for example, the development of a uh, nuclear bomb and sure. uh, <laughs> the way that uh, I'm not excluding women from the acts of war, sure. but let's face facts. Uh, we look at war usually in a masculine Sure. It's context. Hitler and Putin and Stalin and whatever. It's not, yeah. Uh, you know, is it hyperbole? I'm not sure it is. I think it's a very, uh, in some way, it might seem hugely reactive, violently reactive to make a piece of work like this. But it's also a measured account of how one feels when faced with the reality of being marginalized as a woman, brought up in a hugely restrictive patriarchal Catholic culture, um, being sexually abused by a domineering, violent father. I did say also her mother was very violent towards her, but I don't think it's hyperbole. I don't think she's... I think saying only a woman could possibly make something beautiful with something destructive is hyperbole, but that's fine. I also don't like the idea that anybody, well, this is just me generally, is that like, I hate painting any group of people with one brush. It drives me up a wall. You hate painting. That's like, that's like saying, you know, only, only women can be loving and, and supportive and whatever. And it's like, well, of course that's not true. And only men can be violent. There are plenty of women who have been violent. So it's like, so painting, painting things with, you know, I think that it does a disservice to all of those things by, by putting labels on top of labels on top of labels. But Bill, art does put labels on top of labels. I know it does. It's one of the things I don't like about art. <laughs> Maybe we should do a whole session about what Bill doesn't like about art. Well, I think art often tries to simplify things that are far more com that that deserve the complexity. I think I think that life and thought and symbolism is multivariant and cannot be simplified down to broad strokes. It can if you want to talk about you know, symbolism and myth, but those things are shadows of the reality that they're actually trying to portray. Which is why, you know, I'm often frustrated by art, my own included. It feels one dimensional or two dimensional when reality is three dimensional. Yes. Yes, you there. <laughs> I 
I'm all, gonna do some reading though. We're we're gonna talk. All of our modes of expression are limited because they're dead. Sure. Which is why, which is kind of how we were talking last week with Cisco, where it's like the mode of of, of movement is limited by human anatomy and gravity, right? Like this is, you know, it's like the everything's a subset of all art is a subset is a different slice of reality in a different way. What is the closest mode of expression to source? It's my fundamental question. Uh, I think music gets the closest. Do we worship music? I think a lot of people do, especially teenagers. Or at least they used to. I don't think they care right now. Kids nowadays, they don't care about music the way we cared about music. Gosh, you're so funny. You oscillate between saying that these artists oversimplify things, then here you are oversimplifying something. No, no, I, I, I honestly think that that is, there's a lot of evidence for that. They just, it's just not, it's, you know, we were in a weird bubble where music was really important. And it's just not as much. No one listens to albums. You know, and all this kind of stuff. I'm not really saying they should. I'm just saying that, that it's like, now. yeah, but I mean, there's like a certain, um, speaking of reverence, you know what I mean? I don't think that, yeah, it's interesting. I think all of it fails. I mean, honestly, when it comes down to it, I mean, that's where I divide by zero is when I get to the bottom of my thought process and I go, well, none of this is actually getting us any closer to the truth. So why do we bother? And why do I bother? And that's when I go take a nap and then I get sad about it. But it's like we put all this effort in and are we actually any closer now than we were 100 years ago or 500 years ago to actually understanding or communicating the human condition? I don't know that we are. The communication of the human condition is in the human condition, no? Yeah, but that's also inside of human heads that can't be communicated with words or anything else. And it was there before art and it's there after art. Mm -hmm. So why do we make art? See, that's what I worship. Oh, you're so funny, Bill. But I'm gonna do some reading. We're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find a way in. You're gonna use that great big brain to think your way out of all of this. I'm not gonna think my way out of it. I'm gonna read more, see what other people said about it. Because I do not naturally, I'm not naturally attracted to it. So I need some analysis as like footholds. I want to see the images that you worship. I mean, I know the. You know, it's funny. None of the images that I worship were made after the year 1700. Well, no, that's not true. Cause I do love that kind of you one sergeant. So Nothing since 1920. Nothing within the living memory of anyone who's alive. Maybe a bit of a midnight in Paris moment, isn't it? Maybe I've never seen that goodness i know you're a big fan <laughs> right thanks bill thank you sandy um next time i yes. just think we should look at your versions all right i gotta pull two of mine yeah do mine have to have explicit religious symb symbols in them no and if you okay. think that perhaps you've missed the point of what i was saying well i'm just saying <laughs> two, both of yours happen to is all i'm saying both of them have Jesus on the cross right there in the middle. Bye, Bill. Bye, Sandy.